Uh, good morning. I lost my hair and facial hair for the pre preparation for the symposium. <laughs> so the picture and the actual person is different. Hey, so uh, we we'll start with the uh, the first slide. So uh, I will just share with you the present no plastic in nature uh, by 2030 program of WWF. So the whole program is not just locally based, but it's shared uh, through the different agencies in of WWF. So it starts from the global and then the regional and then the local. So we're, we are just embracing one approach and one strategy and applying them to uh, the different countries and local contexts with but we adjust to the local context. So that's the very important aspect. Uh, we are very context specific, dependent on the political nature, culture, especially when you talk about the consumer behavior. So there are three programs that are uh, running right now. The first one will be on uh, business model innovation. So uh, the context here is, as uh, mentioned by Yusek earlier, this approach, uh, the EPR will not happen if the government will solely run the program. So we are really dependent on stakeholder handholding. And at the same time, we have to really adjust. Everyone has to adjust. Businesses, they have to adjust their business models and decrease their profit greed, okay, and move some into the EPR responsibilities, consumers will really have to adjust because uh, we are the ones disposing of the items. The government has to adjust because of the policy frameworks that will start from later on. I'll talk about the glo uh, global plastics policy. It will start with the UN because national and regional frameworks for plastics will not work as we already see with the climate action right now. So uh, I'm hoping that our move towards our cleaning of our behavior towards plastic will be entirely different from how governments adjust to our climate problem. Okay. Uh, one example of Number one will be, second slide, uh, our local program here that's sponsored by USAID and a big corporation. It's the Women Waste Economic Empowerment. So we really have to go down, as you saw earlier from the DTI uh, presentation and DNR, they never mentioned the informal waste sector. So us coming from the development sector, NGO realm, we're going down to the grassroots. Uh, the biggest example here, why we really need to go down is, for example, in India, 90% of the collected waste is collected by the informal sector, not by uh, commercial uh, collectors. So if you transfer the percentage here in the Philippines, maybe it's 50 to 70% of collected waste is done by the informal sector. Those who will just rummage through our garbages. So the point here is to go down to them and realize that we are really dependent on them when it comes to collection. It's very hard to talk about segregation from source, segregation from household. Question is, who will collect? Okay, so from those countries who have already run their EPR program, for example, in Chile, they found out that uh, a drop-off system doesn't work. Maybe because it's time-consuming, you have to bring all your kilos of plastic to a drop-off point and then go back. So what works is a combination of systems. You work with the informal sector and make it door to door with incentives, maybe for the first few years, okay? And what we do right now is to extend. 
the informal sector, we train them through the partnership with uh, Ecoways Foundation. We train them with uh, basic skills training in business. And then they pitch to our corporate partners. And then the corporate partners will fund their venture. So it's either they become a waste collector in their local community or they form a group or a single venture to form a junk shop. So we're really starting below. And next slide, please. So our global plastics policy is really stating that without an international agreement on plastics, nothing will happen. Okay. Uh, we really have to face our reality and uh, see through our own uh, national shadows, our subconscious, that uh, the capitalistic framework might not be working anymore. Okay, so we must include some deference to a real context of responsibility because CSR programs will not work for EPR. So, and at the same time, uh, for example, Ms. Ivy mentioned that the baseline declaration for plastic footprint is voluntary. It might not work because of uh, the corporations will defend themselves. They will protect themselves and uh, veer away from possible fines. This might be true, but some corporations, uh, those who are really active in uh, helping out the government and maybe concerned with nature, their main purpose is to really openly declare. So my idea, this is not the perspective of WWF, my idea is to really have a pre-pandemic declaration. For example, 2019, get the baseline plastic footprint of 2019 before the pandemic and the 2022 declaration of uh, the EPR as a law and then get their 2022 plastic footprint. That should be placed in a common observable platform that can be prepared by EMB so that it's not hidden from the public. Everyone can view, everyone can study, everyone can share their perspective on how we can improve the EPR program. Because uh, this is true for AIM and for all the universities here. If you're a social researcher, if your baseline is not, it's not that good, nothing will happen with your database. So all of your project implementation will be affected. So the, our targets for 2023, it will just trickle down because 2022 is the baseline and it's not regulated. It's voluntary. And uh, I hope that everyone will be honest with their plastic footprint. But with the situation where everyone was surprised that this laws come into effect and there are big fines in the millions, uh, let us pray for their honesty. <laughs> okay. Next slide, please. So this is the step that is followed by our global policy team. So we are now in INC2. The Philippines is a signatory for INC1. So there were 145 countries who signed the initial agreement to proceed for INC2. So for INC2, what WWF is expecting is that at least the definition of plastics that are harmful to the environment and to our own health will be well-defined. So those plastics, in turn, should be phased out slowly or uh, for those plastics that are really detrimental to the environment, they should be banned outright. So this is what I was talking about referring to. If the UN, if we will not have a global treaty on plastic, the national governments will uh, not follow. 
a voluntary system will not work because there are no uh, control measures. We're happy if everyone is honest, if everyone is involved, but uh, if we are to talk about it, this is a core behavioral change, not just from the personal consumer perspective, but it dominoes up to the framework of governments and companies. Everything has to change for us to do this. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm going to our plastic smart cities. So why are we focused on Southeast Asia? This is the reason. 60%, this is already mentioned by USEC, 60% of all mismanaged waste occurs in the Asia Pacific region alone. So if we control this, we control the global effect of plastic, especially in our oceans. Okay, uh, as I mentioned earlier when we were having coffee, uh, a WWF study found out that we might actually be consuming one ATM or one ID in terms of volume of plastic waste per week. So every time you use your ATM or your credit card, remember this, you might be consuming that amount every week. How many more ATMs or credit cards we will consume if we will go the route of business as usual? Because by 2050, the amount of plastic right now in nature will quadruple. So if we won't do anything now, then uh, let's be prepared to make ATM cards and uh, credit cards part of our diet. Next slide. Okay, as you saw from the heat map, the concentration of the scope of work for EPR and for plastic smart cities is really centered around Southeast Asia, especially for Indonesia, Philippines, Hong Kong, Thailand, and Vietnam. So our efforts for EPR and plastic smart cities revolve here. So. Okay, so that's our presentation of what a linear context of consumption looks like and our context for the cir circular practice. So there you will see the upstream from the consumer side and then the downstream, our side as uh, diverters, collectors. Can we go to the, yes, I'll summarize all of the perspective with the this one. Okay. So for the upstream perspective, our aim is to, we really have to have a framework nationally. So a collection system downstream must be established. One LGU can't have a different set of collection practice and waste management practice compared to their neighboring LGUs. That might not work. Okay, so uh, we may adopt, as I told uh, Tony earlier again, uh, during our coffee time, we can adopt the perspective from India that they really just focused on plastic waste management. Because we have to remember that EPR is, might be an improvement of the SWM measures from the 2003 law, 2000, 2000 law, okay? So, but we have to focus since EPR, in a sense, I'm not demonizing the corporations, uh, in a sense can be seen as a polluter pays principle. How do we trace? If we will not have a separate plastic waste management system, we cannot trace from source company to consumers and how it's disposed. So we might have to develop, the purpose here is to develop uh, legal frameworks from the national law, which is dependent or 
uh, later on, if there will be an agreement on global plastics, it has to reflect that nationally. And then LGU laws and BLGU guidance should reflect the EPR. And we have another problem from the political perspective. By October, we will have an, a barangay election. If we will have almost all elections, different people will change, different systems change. So if they're not aware, if they're not aware, and if they do not care about solid waste management, what more about the EPR? So we must try to find means on having a, an agreed mandatory system for our laws, for our companies. And we should also penalize the consumer behavior. Okay, and at the same time for the upstream, we must guarantee environmentally sound waste disposable. Waste disposal where cycling is impossible. The reality is, even if we have a circular economy, there will be waste. So the question is, how do we control the waste or dispose it properly? Okay, and we should always remember, uh, this is my interpretation, the spirit of the EPR law is to unburden the fiscal responsibility of the LGU in managing all of our waste. Because uh, as we would know, uh, poor LGUs will have a hard time paying for the management of all the waste. So uh, given the uh, IRR, I am calling on all of the obliged enterprises and the PROs to really go down to number six of uh, the IRR in terms of recovery and this diversion because number six might just be interpreted as a suggestion that you should work with the LGU, that you should work with the informal sector when in fact it should be the first. Obliged enterprises and PROs should directly work and finance the plastic waste management of the LGU and the barangays. And they, start, should, they should start recognizing the informal waste sector and incorporate them as part of the system. Because the problem, one problem here again is that the informal waste sector might be displaced by the corporations who will handle the solid waste. They might actually be displaced by their own barangays who who pay or who gets uh, outsourcing of their solid waste. Right? We are dependent on the informal waste sector for this one. Okay, and then the IRR through the EMB, uh, I hope that attorney will <laughs> address this later with her boss. Uh, a specific percentage should be placed when a corporation is reducing this amount of volume, this amount of money should be given to them as an EPR incentive. So there should be a quantifiable incentive for the quantifiable reduction that any company will do because it's very expensive to redesign your product packaging. Okay, and then the next one, ensure level playing field. As she said earlier, only 30% have already registered. And USEC also mentioned what we were talking about. The big uh, e-commerce platform, uh, we don't know if they are obliged enterprises, but I think they should be. They should be required to mandatorily collect their own, their own plastic through their distributors. The pro, uh, if this can be an improvement on the EPR implementation. SMEs, uh, your small and medium scale industries are voluntarily uh, required. Okay, they're not, man they will not be sanctioned if they do not follow. Will they follow? I don't think so. So uh, we all know this. 
uh, maybe 40% of our household waste comes from them. One small product is packaged with a bubble wrap, in a bubble wrap that's scotch tape and then placed in a plastic. And sometimes they have their names, but most of the time, maybe after this one, they will take away their names because uh, we will trace the label. Okay. And then the next one, uh, our focus on ensuring social inclusivity. We really have to give importance to our informal waste sector. The simplest step that any barangay can do is to recognize, give them their IDs, allow them to roam the streets, collect door to door. Simple as that. Even if the barangays will not pay for them, because it's their own livelihood, they earn properly. And at the same time, we should also help them and give them capacity building because they should be able to negotiate their own price. We don't know how the PROs and the obliged enterprises will uh, give their rates for their take-back mechanism. But I hope that the informal waste sector uh, will have the capacity to negotiate their own price. Maybe the going rate right now is 20 to 25 pesos per kilo of clean PETs. So that should be the rate. The market rate should be the rate. I think they're only selling it from 7 to 10 pesos. So they're losing on the other half per kilo. So we really have to help them. And that's part of our project through our incorporation of the EPR program with the Women in Waste Economic Entrepreneurship and then the Plastic Smart Cities where we also help the direction of the LGUs up to the barangay where we also help them develop their own MRFs. So this is a whole ecology. This is a very separate ecosystem. This might be a new ecosystem for everyone to handhold. So there shouldn't be any blame shifting because everyone is adjusting. We should be helping out each other. That's, uh, earlier, I volunteered our organization. This is not yet approved. But we're, we're applying as uh, an NGO representative under the N NSWMC for the EPR implementation. And we are volunte volunteering to help them with their plan in spreading the word for the registration. We will use our own resources to help them. So uh, that's part of our commitment to really help make this work. So thank you very much. And I hope that my losing the mohawk and the facial hair will do. And I, since I did not prepare our, our uh, business card, so you may contact us. Our program manager is Sa, and I am specifically handling the our EPR program. So let's hope and share that we can have separate communities of practice with the, I, I forgot before, since you're not yet flashing the time reminder. With our EPR program, we have a present study right now for bioplastics and biodegradable plastics. We are trying to uh, have a white paper where we can uh, describe the situation of the Philippines right now in terms of uh, the studies on alternative to plastic. And one of the results is really the academe needs to have a community of practice because they're doing their own separate researches right now and they're not familiar with their own researches. The second one is uh, we also have a study on the business side, how the EPROs are implementing the, the EPR. And the last one, the output of our incorporation to WE and PSC is to really delve deeper on how we can help the LGUs in their capacity building and at least uh, in the structure formation for their MRFs and the training of their incorporation of the informal waste sector. So thank you very much and good morning.